Good morning, everybody. It is great to be here in Helsinki. It feels a bit like my second home. I spend about 25% of my time here. And uh, it's good to be in a university as well. I'm actually still a student. Um, I'm actually doing my PhD at the moment in uh, a university in the UK called Loughborough University. And I'm looking at knowledge work through the lens of endurance sport. I'm looking at knowledge work as an endurance activity. And that is particularly relevant because in the future of work, we're going to be living and working for longer than ever. Retirement age is being delayed in many places. Life expectancy has doubled since about 1900. But this PhD journey for me was quite interesting. I've worked in industry for about 10 years. Um, and I graduated back in 2008. And I was one of these students who, who said, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to work for a year or two and I'll come back and do my PhD. I've just got to figure out what I'm going to do it in. And one year became two years, became three years. But funnily enough, about two years ago, I was at a, an event just before slush uh, around this time of year, actually. And I met one of your professors who's here today, uh, uh, Professor Nina Nermi. I remember we had a, an interesting chat. And I said, I'm thinking about doing my PhD. And Nina said, you should just go for it. And, uh, and that was an important step that, uh, that led to what I'm doing today. And actually, um, I collaborate quite closely with Alto and with Nina and her team as we're exploring some of these questions. So I call myself a performance scientist because I'm fascinated with the future of work with one question in particular. What is the key to sustainable high performance? And we're going to delve into that question today. We're going to go through a number of phases today. I'm going to talk a little bit about the background to some of my research and some of the thinking in this area. What is maybe inhibiting sustainable high performance? What can we do about it? I'm going to share some practical tips with you. But then also talk about some of the phenomena, some of the psychological barriers and environmental barriers that stop us taking this good information and putting it into practice. But we have about two hours together this morning. So I'd really encourage you to ask questions. Please raise your hand if you've got something that you'd like to say uh, or a question that you'd like to ask. Uh, now, I've communicated and shared quite a lot with Finnish audiences over the last couple of years. And um, I've come to recognize that it takes you sometimes a little while to warm up. You know, Maybe you're not kind of a typical audience, I don't know. But um, please overcome that innate kind of uh, um, desire maybe to just stay and listen. Please ask questions, otherwise I'm going to have to talk for a very long time. I wasn't always a scientist. Um, actually, this journey into exploring this subject began for me uh, a long time ago, back uh, actually about 15, 16 years ago, when I was a full-time racing cyclist. I'd moved to France to pursue my dream of becoming a professional cyclist. And it was then that my interest and my passion in measuring and trying to improve human performance first began to really grow and accelerate. Unfortunately, my cycling career didn't quite reach the heights that I hoped. But I returned to the UK to study sports science and eventually I set up my own coaching business. And most of my clients were amateur cyclists. They had very demanding jobs in London, where I was based at the time, and outside of their jobs as being architects, solicitors, finance professionals, for some reason they also decided to pursue very challenging cycling events. During this time, three important things happened. The first was that I became fascinated with knowledge work. I wanted to try and understand better what was going on during my clients' work days. Secondly, I started to apply tools and frameworks from sports science to try and understand knowledge work better. And finally, I had a revelation. That revelation was that knowledge work is an endurance activity. And that has inspired a lot of my work and research today. In particular, I'm looking at knowledge workers and their daily rhythms of sleep, of stress, and of cognitive performance in particular. So, what is the key to sustainable high performance? Well, ironically, we're going to be getting you to get out your phones quite a lot today. Um, you're going to be potentially tweeting some of the stuff that you see here later on. Olivia is going to introduce this app uh, called Hair Hair. And I think these, these tools are very powerful assistants, but they are terrible masters. Are you among the 79% of people who check their smartphone within 15 minutes of waking up this morning? If you are, I'm afraid you haven't found the key to sustainable high performance. Are you among the 42% who admit to using email in the bathroom? 
sure no one here does that. I certainly never have, honestly. You know, the average knowledge worker, according to some research, is interrupted once every 11 minutes. We check in on our communication tools once every six minutes. And what do we do at the end of that incredibly demanding day where we've been switching constantly and we just want to relax? Well, maybe we get home, we put something on the big screen, maybe we watch something on Netflix. But we can't just watch that big screen anymore. We have to switch between the big screen, our smartphone and our tablet computer as we're sitting there on the sofa an average of 21 times per hour. We're never resting. We're rarely focused. We're always on. But we can't always be on. And that truth is particularly apparent in endurance athletes. See, in endurance sport, if you put your effort in the wrong place at the wrong time, you quickly become exhausted. So I'm going to share some principles and some stories from endurance sport as we start today that I think share some lessons that apply equally well to the endurance activity of knowledge work. See, in endurance sport, it is crucial that we apply our effort in the right place at the right time. To do this, we often use something called training zones or intensity zones. If anyone has done any kind of endurance sport or endurance activity, it's likely that you're familiar with this framework. Now, in summary, simply put, there are three intensity zones that we're particularly interested in. There's a slow zone, a low intensity zone, where we can ride or run quite slowly, but for a very long time. There's a medium intensity zone where we're going at a moderate intensity, and we can keep that going for a moderate amount of time. And then there is a high intensity zone where for a cyclist, we can ride very fast, but only for a short time. And when we're thinking about training or we're thinking about competition, we think about these three zones and we create plans for physical endurance so people put their effort in the right place at the right time. And crucially, in a way that will suit their personal rhythm where they are going to be at their best. Claire Jones is a master's road cyclist who I've been working with for a few years now. By day, she's a finance professional in London, and in her spare time, she pursues very demanding cycling events. In particular, she's been targeting an event over the last few years called the Etape de Tour. <coughs> it provides the opportunity for amateur cyclists to ride a stage of the Tour de France just a few days before the professionals. In 2017, we felt that the route suited her particularly well. In fact, that final climb to the Col d'Isoard was really well suited to her characteristics. Consequently, we created a plan for her physical endurance based around when she needed to ride at low, moderate and high intensity respectively, really targeting that final climb. Claire's aim was to finish in the top 20, which was going to be quite an achievement given that there were thousands of people in this event. After the event, I started to look at the data. Claire finished in just under seven hours. During that time, she expended 4,500 kilojoules of energy. That's equivalent to about 14 and a half cheeseburgers. But unfortunately, Claire was way outside her objective. She only finished 54, 34 places behind where she hoped to be. Something had gone wrong. So I said I'd look into the data to see what I could find. And this is actually a screenshot from that data. What I could see straight away was that where she was supposed to be at her best towards the end of the race, she wasn't able to maintain her power output. Basically, she put her effort in the wrong place at the wrong time. She didn't rest where she needed to. Ultimately, she followed someone else's rhythm rather than her own. In fact, she followed a fast group at the start when she should have been taking it easy. But Claire isn't the kind of person to give up. In 2018, the route also suited her quite well with a difficult final climb. But this time, she shifted her mindset. She was very clear about where to focus effort. She knew when to take some rest, and perhaps most importantly, this time, she was committed to find and follow her own rhythm. Now, as soon as I looked at the data, I could see that there was a difference. In many ways, it was similar. She finished in a similar amount of time, expended a similar amount of energy. But as you can see from this graph, she performed very well in that final climb. She was able to maintain that power output. In fact, she finished well inside the top 20. She was 16th overall, and she was third in her age group. It was her best result in the ETAP ever. So I think there are three lessons from this endurance performance that I think apply equally well to the endurance activity of knowledge work. 
These are that we can achieve better results for similar efforts if we apply the effort in the right place at the right time. Second, we need to recover, even if we don't feel like it. And third, perhaps most importantly, we need to find and follow our own rhythm. Pay attention to when we are at our best. But some of you are probably thinking, that's fine. Cycling performance is quite easy to measure. You know, in contrast, knowledge work and cognitive performance is a little bit more difficult to record. Are you aware of those rhythms? Do you pay any kind of attention to them? Well, regardless of whether you do or not, cognitive performance actually varies by about 20% during the average day. Now, most of us, many of us, about 20% in fact, experience this variation as a peak, a valley, and then a rebound. We might call this 20% early birds. People generally feel at their best in the mornings. Another 20% of the population, we might call them owls, experience this variation in cognitive performance in reverse. They start the day with a rebound, they still have a valley in the middle, but their peak, when they feel at their best, comes later in the day, even into the evening. Now, about 60% of the population, according to most research, fall somewhere in between. But regardless of whether you're an early bird, an owl, or somewhere in the middle, these three phases have distinct characteristics. That peak is generally the best time for focus, for analysis, and productivity. That complex, demanding work. That valley is the best time for rest, for recovery, and reflection. And that rebound is a great opportunity for the menial tasks and the switching work that characterizes at least part of most knowledge workers' day. 2.55 p.m. We're a few hours away yet. But according to some research, that is the least productive time of day for most British workers. Do you experience that slump in most days? I'd like you to think about it for a moment. And most of us experience that valley at some point. But what do you do in the middle of it? So I've got an activity for you. Um, I'm going to use a little scale, and we're each going to try and discover our personal rhythm. Now, you've probably all got a sense of whether you're more a morning type or more an evening type or somewhere in the middle. But this is actually a simple validated scale called the circadian energy scale, which we can use now to figure out where we fall. And after that, I'm going to ask for a show of hands, and we're going to get a sense of what kind of proportions we've got in the room. It might be quite interesting. So it's quite a simple scale to use. I'd like you to answer the following questions. The first question is, in general, how is your energy level in the morning? And rate yourself from one to five, where one is very low energy, high at five is very high energy. And the second question is, in general, how is your energy level in the evening? Again, from one to five. And when you've done that, I'd like you to take your Evening score minus morning score. So you subtract morning from evening. Evening score minus morning score. You'll get a number. And then take a look at how um, you rate on this, uh, this kind of index here and see whether you're a morning type, neither type, or evening type. And uh, you can find out using that, that little uh, index there. So you're all academics. Sure, that shouldn't be too hard. Take a moment to do that. And, um, and then when you have, just raise your hands if you've finished, and then put your hand down, and then I'll get a raise of hands for each of these three types. You ready? Go. No pressure. Okay. Either everyone's finished and doesn't want to raise their hands, or everyone's really, really slow at subtraction. Um, I'll go for the first one. So. How many people here um, fall into that morning type category? You class yourself as an early bird. Yeah, interesting. How many people would class themselves as a, an owl, kind of a late type? Yeah, and how many people fall somewhere in between? Okay, yeah, so that sounds about proportional, really, in terms of um, what the literature would say. About 20% morning type, 20% evening type, about 60% somewhere in between. Now, this, this kind of idea of personal rhythms and morning type and evening type is, um, is a really um, current topic. There's a lot of discussion about it, which I'm sure many of you are aware. And, and actually, there's often a, a kind of bias towards morning types. You know, there's some literature to suggest that um, we actually think that people who um, are morning types 
work harder, are perhaps more diligent. We attribute all these kind of positive characteristics to morning types. But actually, we may be missing out on the opportunity to get the best out of ourselves or our teams by forcing ourselves into this. You know, actually, one of the things that we find is that as we get older, then our, uh, our, our kind of morningness actually increases. We become more like morning types. But anyone here who's uh, got teenage kids or knows teenagers will know that they hate getting up in the mornings. And that's because actually their circadian rhythm is actually later, shifted later, and becomes more morning type as they get older. But actually, the workplace is often set up for morning types. You know, we actually often insist that people come in early. But actually, for most of human history, this difference has been incredibly adaptive. If you think about kind of our ancient past, our prehistoric ancestors, actually having people, a few people who were very morning type, a few people who were very evening type, and some people in between, would mean that actually for a tribe, there'd only be a relatively short amount of time where everybody was asleep. So it would actually be quite adaptive. Some people would be awake to be able to protect the tribe from, from threats, for example. And I wonder, perhaps um, paradoxically, that as we move into this, this period of you know, hyper-technology and digitalization and development, perhaps we need to move back towards this more prehistoric way of living, actually more in line with our own personal rhythms, and perhaps discover some ways to introduce that kind of flexibility so that we can get the best out of ourselves and our team. One of the challenges that we have is that we're not paying attention to those rhythms. And it's very likely that we're limiting our cognitive performance as a result of that. You know, we're going to live and work for longer than ever. And actually, our human cognitive capabilities are going to become an increasingly important differentiator in the future of work. We need brains and we need bodies to go the distance. Now, before I go on to the next section, I'm going to give you a little opportunity because I'm sure you're all very polite and don't want to interrupt. Has anyone got any, any questions or comments before we move on? Still warming up? Okay. <laughs> well, feel free. So, one of the questions that fascinates me when we think about human performance and the future of work is what skills and abilities are going to be required to help us not to just survive but to thrive? to really differentiate ourselves from other humans, but also from some of the other competition that we might face. I'm convinced that the future of work is likely to be characterized by humans and machines working more effectively together, at least for part of the population. This graphic, uh, which was taken from a couple of different sources of research, describes the capabilities that humans and machines express. And, and actually, we can look at this and create a kind of uh, a typology to, to understand what humans and machines are better at, respectively. But ideally, I think the future of work should be characterized by humans and machines working more effectively together in an age of intelligent automation. Hopefully, that means more specialized roles, improved decision making, perhaps increased productivity and efficiency, hopefully, particularly in my role, enhanced innovation. But in most human roles, actually according to some evidence, about 30% of the work in those roles could already be automated with technology that we have available. But as a human performance scientist, I'm not so interested in that 30% that could be automated. I'm actually more interested in that 70% that can't be automated yet and might never be automated. And I'm convinced that that 70% is likely to be characterized by our most human capabilities. That 70% is likely to be characterized by capabilities such as complex problem solving, collaboration, creativity. But these capabilities, they're not going to be expressed at their fullest with our current ways of living and working. Because these capabilities are the output of arrested and focused brain. You know, the real danger, I don't think, isn't that artificial intelligence and machines are going to keep working increasingly like humans. It's that we humans will keep trying to work like machines. So we're going to switch off. We're going to change gears. We're not going to stay on. We might even switch off and drop out because I've got a question for you. A very important question. Could LSD be the key to sustainable high performance? 
Well, I've got a treat for you. Uh, no, really, I'll probably get arrested. Um, I was fascinated to read an article in the Financial Times a couple of months ago about a new generation of San Franciscans who feel that micro doses of LSD make them more productive and focused. And uh, I read on. I was interested, particularly as they interviewed Paul, a startup founder from New York, who says that he and his employees feel less stressed, more focused, engaged, creative since they started microdosing with LSD. But, Paul continued, he couldn't be absolutely sure about the cause and the effect. It might have also been the project management system, Asana, which they started using at the same time to keep organized. You know, if we can't tell the difference, between a software as a service and a psychedelic substance, I don't think we're really addressing the root cause of the problem. We're always looking for these hacks, these shortcuts, and this kind of approach is becoming increasingly prevalent. This was a piece of research which was published in Nature last year, which looked at the increase in use of both prescribed and illegal stimulants for the purposes of cognitive enhancement based on an anonymous survey. And you can see that in um, all of these countries which were surveyed, that um, the, the reported rates of the use of these substances for cognitive enhancement has increased. You know, in fact, stimulant use, that's both prescribed and illegal, for the purposes of cognitive enhancement has increased in all the countries monitored and particularly in the European Union we've seen some quite significant increases. So whether you're a student here or faculty this is likely to be something that is affecting perhaps your colleagues and also almost certainly students in this institution and institutions across the world in fact. But actually you know the solution could be much more simple. You know, I think that sometimes we're, we may be skipping a few steps ahead. I actually think that the solution might not be in a pill. It's more likely by beginning with more human rhythms of work and rest. Knowing where to focus effort. Being clear about when to rest. Finding and following our own rhythm. Paying attention to when we are at our best. I decided to investigate this as part of my research and recently I recruited 100 knowledge workers. I tracked them for 14 days and during that time I looked in particular at their sleep, their stress and their cognitive performance. Now one of the methods that I used to, uh, to investigate this was a smartphone based cognitive assessment tool and uh, I actually got some really good data from it that I'm writing up at the moment. And it uh, actually got some pretty good adherence as well. If anyone's got any questions about those methods, I'd be more than happy to delve into the, the weeds with that. But um, I've got some kind of average preliminary analysis um, that I can share with you um, and uh, that uh, is likely to, I'm likely to write up. Uh, and I'm in the process of writing up at the moment. And you can see that on a group level, there are some quite significant variations in cognitive performance. One of the things that I, de I did was to get all of this group to measure their cognitive performance at both the beginning and end of each working day and also at the weekends. But I was interested in what was really driving this cognitive performance. Where were the strongest associations between health and well-being lifestyle factors and cognitive performance in these high-performance knowledge workers? And what I found was that, in particular, probably unsurprisingly, stress and sleep have some of the strongest associations with cognitive performance in this group. And actually, the particular aspect of cognitive performance that was most significantly impacted by too much stress or inadequate sleep was actually a cognitive capability called inhibitory control. That's the part of the brain which helps us to both switch on and switch off. That helps us to resist what we call preponent responses, uh, those reactions, and actually take a step back and think about what we really want to do. Some of the downstream consequences of diminished inhibition could include an increased reliance on stereotypes and heuristics. It might make us more prone to falling victim to biases, for example. It's one of the most important cognitive capabilities for a high performance knowledge worker in their work, but also potentially in terms of managing our well-being as well. So it seems that we get caught in this vicious cycle because as we sleep less, our inhibitory control reduces, so we're actually more likely to do the things which will stop us sleeping less in the future. Now, some of us have probably experienced that phenomenon where you, know, you get home after a long day or maybe you're in a hotel, I travel a lot, and you decide to put something on Netflix, and before you know it, you've binge watched five episodes and you've suddenly lost an extra four hours of sleep. 
You know, I think one of the most unhelpful functions that Netflix ever introduced was autoplay. You know, you can even skip the introduction of the next episode, can't you? And it's just this continuous stream. My top tip for you today is go into your account settings and turn autoplay off if that is, uh, if that is a problem for you. Um, don't rely on that inhibitory control. Now, I can delve into the data in more detail if anyone's interested. You know, the statistical techniques I've been using. We've also found some really interesting relationships between things like resilience and burnout as well in this mix. But the kind of the broad summary is that people who follow rhythms of work and rest both feel better and perform better. And if you're too stressed and you're sleep deprived, it's unlikely that you're performing sustainably. What a surprise. Got another question for you since you're not asking me any questions. Um, Sleeping six hours per night for two weeks results in performance that is A, better than normal, B, unchanged, C, equivalent to no sleep for 24 hours, or D, equivalent to no sleep for 48 hours. So how many people think that if you slept for six hours for two weeks, that your performance would be better than normal? Let's see a show of hands for A. How many people think their performance would be unchanged, B? How many people think, C, it would be equivalent to no sleep with that for 24 hours? Yeah, you've all been on the program, haven't you? And D, <laughs> equivalent to no sleep for 48. Well, very good. It's actually equivalent to having no sleep for 24 hours. See, how many, what is the average sleep of this group here? Does anyone here track their sleep? Maybe a few people. So how many people here think that they regularly get seven hours of sleep on average per night? Yeah, that's great, that's good. And I'd be really interested to see the data compared with uh, your self-report compared with what actually happens. You know, the, the study that I just conducted in this 100 knowledge workers you know, found that there was actually quite a significant difference between self-report and what we measured using an actigraph, um, an academically validated wearable. And actually what we found, uh, interestingly, so um, two of the biggest participant groups were from uh, two of the world's largest management consultancies. And actually what we found in this group was that their average sleep at a group level was actually pretty good. It's about 6.8 hours. But the problem was, was that for at least two to three nights per week, uh, during the week, they were sleeping significantly under seven hours. And then they were trying to top up at the weekends. But the problem is, is that the evidence would suggest that we can't really bank sleep. And so what we actually found in the study was that the groups which accumulated the most significant sleep deficit during the working week had the greatest declines in cognitive performance. And yes, they did recover during the week, but one of the interesting findings was that um, I compared two of these management consultancies and, uh, and the group, the management consultancy which accumulated the biggest sleep debt, and the gap between them and their nearest competitor actually increased quite a lot as a consequence. Uh, it looks like as a consequence of that sleep, uh, that sleep deficit. And so one of the things I'd encourage you to pay attention to is not just your average sleep, but also how many nights, particularly in succession, are you sleeping under that seven hours? Um, that data, that uh, finding, was actually taken from a study that was done by a group led by Van Dongen back in 2003, um, where they looked at the cumulative cost of additional wakefulness. And so to do this, they um, split a group of participants into three conditions. There was one group uh, where they restricted sleep entirely for one night. Um, there was a group where they restricted sleep to six hours for two weeks. And then another group of participants where they got to sleep for eight hours for two weeks. And so this graph shows cognitive performance um, as a result in lapses, um, uh, expresses lapses in attention in a psychomotor vigilance task. So basically you can see as the line goes up, that's as the number of errors, the number of mistakes actually increased and so as you might expect in this group, this red line here, who didn't sleep at all for one night, their performance um, gets a lot worse. They make a lot more mistakes very, very quickly. Um, and so um, in terms of these arbitrary units, you know, it hits 10 um, after um, one night without any sleep. Now, as you might expect as well, in this, uh, with this green line, we've got this group who got to sleep eight hours for, for two weeks, lucky them. Actually, they um, had some error increase, but really it plateaued. Their performance stayed um, pretty good for the whole two weeks. But the most interesting result for me, and actually for the researchers, was that it was this group whose sleep was restricted for six hours. Because what you see is that after two weeks, cognitive performance diminishes, error rate increases, equivalent to going without sleep for one night entirely. 
Now, a lot of people, when I show them this data, they say, you know, I'm the exception. Um, this doesn't apply to me. But the, uh, this group led by Van Dongen actually tried to control for this kind of phenomenon as well. And so what they did is, in addition to restricting sleep in these groups, um, they also got the subjects, the participants, to, um, to fill in something called the Stanford Sleepiness Scale. And so what they found was that, again, as you might expect, with this red line in the group whose sleep was restricted entirely for a night, actually their, their level of self-rated sleepiness increased to a pretty high level pretty quickly. But if you look at this group who only slept for six hours per night, while their, their sleepiness, their self-rated sleepiness increased initially, it actually tapered off. Essentially, people who were sleeping for six hours per night felt fine. They thought they were okay. They only felt slightly more sleepy than the group that was sleeping for eight hours per night. But their cognitive performance was diminished, equivalent to going without sleep for an entire night. Now, students here, academics here, many knowledge workers today, you know, we are paid for using these brains, for those complex cognitive capabilities, for complex problem solving, for collaboration, for creativity. And so many of us are compromising our cognitive performance simply because we're not sleeping adequately, and we're not sleeping adequately sustainably over consecutive nights. Do you know that after 18 hours of wakefulness, that's equivalent to working from 8 a.m. to 2 a.m., which many of us will have done. I sometimes call it activating musk mode. After 18 hours of wakefulness, cognitive performance is equivalent to being legally drunk in most European countries. You know, we're not in the habit of congratulating people for turning up to work wasted. But how often have we patted ourselves on the back or someone else for doing that all nighter? See, sleep is a very interesting phenomenon. And actually, when we sleep, uh, we go through distinct phases. Uh, we go through uh, a cycle called non-REM sleep, and then we go through these cycles of REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. And ideally, we go through a cycle of non-REM and REM once every 90 minutes. Now, this slow wave sleep, this non rapid eye movement sleep. This is where your body really recovers. During this time, protein synthesis is increased. We, our body secretes growth hormone. And so that non-REM sleep is really important to rebuild your body. It's actually during the REM sleep, the rapid eye movement sleep, that we see the brain recover. Actually, memories and learning is consolidated, for example. Some people sometimes describe it as the defragmentation process of the brain. Now, there's still so much to be understood about sleep. We're really just scratching the surface. But it seems pretty conclusive that it is essential that we maximize the number of these 90-minute cycles, allowing our body to recover and our brain to recover. And if we don't, it seems to be associated not just with short-term problems, like diminished cognitive performance, but it may also be associated with some quite negative long-term health consequences perhaps even being associated with neurodegenerative conditions uh, and also diabetes. Now, one of the things that we see when you restrict sleep is that physiologically your body can start to behave as if you were diabetic. Um, and uh, even after a relatively short period of sleep restriction, likely because you've eliminated the possibility for your body to recover in that slow wave sleep period. And also we see consistently that our cognitive performance is diminished and we don't learn. Again, we are in a learning environment. Sleep is likely the most potent performance enhancer you have available. We don't really need to be worrying about sleep, uh, about LSD and, uh, and other cognitive uh, pharmaceuticals just yet. But how often do we limit it? You know, um, my wife and I have got two kids, and they're four and seven now. And, um, uh, and recently, uh, we decided to re-watch a, um, a box set on Netflix that we had watched when one of our kids was, uh, was quite young. And I've got quite a good memory, I'd like to think. I remember things quite clearly. And generally, I hate re-watching any kind of TV show or film because I remember it so clearly. But we were watching this box set, this series that was in the middle of a long number of series, and I know I've watched that series. But as my wife and I were sitting there watching it, it was like I was watching it for the first time. I couldn't remember anything about it. And when I kind of uh, looked back in my mind and, and figured out when I watched that first series, it was during a period where we were at our most sleep deprived, where our second child basically just wasn't sleeping. And it's just incredible you know, how we don't even notice, but these memories, so much learning is completely lost. So reducing the number of sleep 
uh, the number of sleep, uh, reducing the amount of sleep reduces the number of sleep cycles that we have. And some evidence would suggest that, for example, if you restricted your sleep from eight hours to six hours, you basically reduce the opportunities for memory and learning consolidation by about 40%. I decided to do a little experiment on myself to uh, investigate this, and uh, I tracked my sleep using, uh, using a, a kind of bedroll that I carry around with me. And you can see some data here from earlier in the year where um, I managed to average about seven and a half hours of sleep, uh, even during a particularly demanding period of travel. Uh, actually, last year I did about 168 flights. Um, this year I've reduced that run rate a little bit, but it's still quite a lot. But I try to be so disciplined about my sleep. Um, but uh, in the interest of science, I decided to do an experiment in sleep disruption. And you can see the results of this N equals 1 experiment here. Um, on the left was my ideal night of sleep. It was just over eight hours. It didn't take me very long to get to sleep. You can see these, uh, um, this is kind of the sleep latency here, um, how long it took for me to actually get to sleep once I got in bed. And you can see that from those wave patterns, the sleep was quite deep and efficient. You know, this uh, indicates those 90-minute those cycles. But in this experimental condition on the right-hand side, I only got six hours and 20 minutes of sleep. It took me much longer to get to sleep, and actually the sleep was very shallow and inefficient. So what do you think I did to induce this experimental condition? Well, it started off with a lot of caffeine throughout the entire day, and purely in the interests of scientific discovery, um, I invited some uh, fellow researchers to uh, participate and we, um, we had a few drinks. Um, what about alcohol? Because that caffeine and that alcohol completely destroyed my sleep. See, one of the problems with alcohol is that it sedates us, but it doesn't actually restore us during that sleep. So actually, when you consume alcohol, it completely disrupts those natural sleep cycles, which you can see in that graphic that I showed you. And so actually, there's a very clear dose-response relationship with um, alcohol and sleep disruption. And so actually, if you drink enough, you can completely disrupt those sleep cycles. And it would actually mean that you can wake up in the morning, essentially having no restorative brain or body sleep. So you won't go through any of those normal non-rapid eye movement or rapid eye movement cycles. So one of the reasons a hangover feels so bad is not just because you're incredibly dehydrated and your body's full of all kinds of toxins because essentially even if you've gone to bed it's like you've not really slept. So one of the problems with alcohol is that it inhibits that parasympathetic nervous system. That's that we sometimes call it the rest and digest system, the rest and recovery system. And there's this very clear dose dependent relationship between alcohol and its disruptive effects. It interferes with those restorative functions of sleep. And you can see that with things like increased heart rate, for example. I live in France, actually, at the moment. We, um, we live uh, just outside of Geneva in the mountains uh, in a region called the Rhone Alps. And, um, and the French say that uh, really there are three major food groups that you should be most interested in. Uh, the first is alcohol, the second is caffeine, and the third is nicotine. And um, I'm going to talk about the first two today. So we all feel really guilty about drinking now, right? You know, my, my, uh, my um, kind of best advice around alcohol consumption is um, uh, start early and finish early. So uh, <laughs> some people interpret that as uh, drink at breakfast, but I certainly, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't advocate that, particularly because uh, I'm being filmed right now. But, you know, we, m many of us enjoy a drink, and that's fine. But one of the things I'd encourage you to do is to think carefully about when you drink. Um, and uh, there's this whole movement in the UK at the moment, this uh, thing around mindful drinking. You know, it's about actually, if you are going to drink, like uh, drink something that you're really going to enjoy, drink something that uh, you will savour, rather than just falling into that trap of drinking just because you drink. Uh, one of the things I'm trying to do at the moment is limit my alcohol consumption between, uh, um, uh, so I only drink at weekends. I try not to drink between Monday and, and Friday, uh, just as a way to kind of get out of that habit, because it's just so easy, isn't it? You know, I don't know, maybe I'm revealing too much, but you know, you get, you kind of get home after a hard day or whatever, and you know, there's always an excuse. It's like, maybe you've had a really good day. Oh, you know, I'll have a glass of wine. Maybe you've had a really bad day. Oh, I'll have a glass of wine. You know, maybe it's just a normal day. Oh, well, the bottle's open. I'll just, you know, I'll have one glass. And it's so easy, but I'd encourage you to do an N equals one experiment. You know, try to reduce alcohol consumption, ideally eliminate al alcohol consumption for a period of days, and see what effect that has on your sleep in particular. I think you'd be really surprised. So 
Alcohol, unfortunately, we've got to limit that. Um, but then there's caffeine, isn't there? Um, I know that Finland is a big caffeine-consuming country. The Finns love their coffee. So do I. It's a big part of my life. Um, there are many upsides to caffeine. Actually, caffeine is an incredibly potent cognitive performance enhancer. Um, you know, caffeine and alcohol are these really interesting molecules because essentially they've kind of been grandfathered into uh, legislation in the sense that you know, if alcohol suddenly was discovered today, um, then it's very likely it would be illegal. Um, it is so potent. And actually there's an argument to suggest that caffeine is so potent that, and, so, and actually quite addictive, it would probably be a controlled substance. But because it's been in our society and our cultures for so long, we just kind of accept it. But caffeine is actually, as a molecule, in a similar group to many amphetamines. You know, its structure isn't that dissimilar. And actually, we see some very similar effects in terms of caffeine on the brain and the body. Uh, things like improved reaction times, enhanced alertness. And actually, I think, if you get a good coffee, it tastes nice, which is uh, a bonus. But unfortunately, there are some downsides to caffeine. One of the big downsides of caffeine is that it actually has quite a long half-life. So it takes about five hours for the circulating concentration of caffeine in your bloodstream to reach half of, uh, of what it was when you first um, consumed it and it was absorbed. And in practice, that means that it takes a very long time for caffeine to get out of your system, for it to be metabolized. And the consequence of that is that um, it means that if you've still got caffeine circulating in your system, it can take longer to get to sleep and also the sleep that you have can be more disruptive because it's a stimulant. The last thing that you want is to be alert when you're trying to get to sleep. Now, the reason that caffeine does this is that it actually blocks the uptake of a, a molecule called adenosine. So, so actually, one of the ways that we um, actually get to sleep is that during the course of the day, this molecule called adenosine accumulates in concentration in our body. And so adenosine is part of this molecule called adenosine triphosphate, and it's kind of like the energy currency of life. So all the day as we're kind of moving around and we're kind of uh, being energetic and we're doing things and we're eating and we're moving and we're digesting and we're thinking, this adenosine molecule is accumulating in concentration. And actually, if you imagine that as this adenosine concentration increases, this kind of level increases, it actually makes us feel more sleepy. It increases sleep pressure. So that is one of the kind of mechanisms by which sleep pressure increases and we get sleepy. But caffeine helps to keep us alert because it's actually got a similar shape and it blocks the receptors for adenosine and stops our body kind of actually uh, attach, stops that adenosine molecule attaching. And so it actually stops that sleep pressure increasing and makes us feel more alert. Now that's very effective but it can be also quite disruptive. I've got another question for you. You see I anticipated there weren't going to be any questions. Which type of coffee has the most caffeine? Is it A, a double espresso? B, a tall, regular Americano? C, a flat white? Or D, a grande caramel macchiato? So, show of hands, how many people think A, a double espresso, has the most caffeine? Mm -hmm. How many people think B, Americano? C, flat white? And D, grande caramel macchiato? Nobody. Tricked you all. They've actually all got <laughs> the same amount of caffeine. Isn't that incredible? So, you know, I used to be the person that fell into the trap. I was like, oh, you know, do you want a coffee? Well, it's the afternoon. I'll just have a flat white. You know, it's not so strong. Like, you know, I've never had a grande caramel macchiato in my life. Um, you know, I just, I don't think I could live with myself, frankly. Um, but, um, but, you know, we all think the double espresso, it must be the punchy one. Um, but it's not. Actually, it's all the same. And so that's something to think about. So if you're kind of knocking back the flat whites later in the day and the, the half-life of caffeine is five hours, just think about what's going on. You know, if you consume a drink, a coffee of some description at 11 o'clock in the morning, um, there is still some circulating caffeine that might be sufficient to interfere with your sleep uh, when you're trying to go to sleep at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Again, if you don't believe me, I encourage you to do an N equals 1 experiment. So at the moment, one of the things I try and do is I don't have any caffeine generally um, after 12 o'clock, after midday. And it significantly improved my sleep. Um, you know, that combined with the alcohol restriction has made a really big difference. 
you know, I travel a lot with my role, as I mentioned, and one of the things that happens with that is that sleep is disrupted anyway because of time zone changes and, and hotels. And there was a period of time where my sleep was absolutely disastrous. You know, and I'd be giving these presentations and like talking about human performance and just feeling like I was going to die, you know. Um, and simply restricting alcohol and limiting caffeine has had a profound impact. And so if you don't believe me, if you think you're one of these people who you know, is immune and can knock back a double espresso after dinner without any problems, and I was certainly in that category, humor me. Do an experiment, see what happens. Because you're, you might feel like you're doing your best work on that kind of caffeine and espresso fueled all nighter. It's very likely that you're not. Back to the data in that study uh, that I was doing. One of the other things that I looked at was stress. And in this group of high performance knowledge workers, you could see in particular that levels of stress in this group were higher than normal for, for most of the participants. I used something called the State Trait Anxiety, in, uh, anxiety Inventory, the STAI, just a six item um, survey, which has been quite well validated. And, and this is the normal range, which is described by the literature, and most people were, were above that. Now, again, I was interested in what, was, what were the strongest associations with stress? And one of the things that, um, that I found was that about 50% of people report moderate to high levels of stress and anxiety, and also physical and cognitive burnout. But there's this really interesting bi-directional relationship between stress and sleep. And it means that we can, can get caught in these vicious cycles, or perhaps more positively, create virtuous cycles. Because when we have too much stress, it seems to reduce our sleep duration. But then, actually, when we sleep more, it actually seems to reduce our stress. But you've got to pick one to start with. Which one do you think you can, you can manage the best? Which one do you think you can have the biggest impact in? And at a group level, I'm not really sure what that is yet, but sleep and stress seem like they are really reasonable and logical targets, plausible targets for actually improving cognitive performance and making performance more sustainable, sustainable but also enhancing well-being as well. You know, work-related stress is estimated to cost the European Union 136 billion euros per year. And not only is it costing this, it may be responsible, according to some research, for one-fifth of staff turnover. So we've got to find ways to try and manage stress and also increase sleep. And one of the ways that it seems that we can manage stress um, quite practically is actually through acute bouts of exercise, so short bouts of exercise. There's some really good evidence to suggest that even a short bout of activity, you know, simply moving for a few minutes, um, can enhance both mood and cognition. Now this mood factor is quite an important one. So I looked at um, stress using this state trait anxiety inventory, but at the same time, I also used something called the positive uh, and negative affective scale, the, the PANAS scale, uh, which is a 20 item survey um, to, to measure both uh, positive and negative affect. So basically positive and negative mood. And one of the interesting things that I found was that um, mood, positive mood in particular, was act actually had one of the strongest associations with cognitive performance. And this has been supported by literature in various different places. Basically, feeling better actually seems to result in better cognitive performance. And actually, when we looked at positive mood as a kind of moderator, it actually seemed to kind of maybe even buffer people from some of the negative effects of relatively high levels of stress. And this is quite intuitive, isn't it, in many ways, as well as having some data to back this up. How do you feel if you get up and you actually do something? You kind of uh, increase your, your blood flow a little bit. You increase your heart rate a little bit. You feel pretty good, don't you? So what time is it now? I've been talking for nearly an hour, 55 minutes. So what I'm going to get you to do is all stand up. And we're going to have some complete chaos. So I want everybody, over the even if it takes about two minutes, I would like you to come out of this uh, of your rows and do one lap of this lecture hall round and then come back to your seats okay so clap your hands three times if you can hear me excellent how do you feel after that acute bout of activity feel a bit more alert bit and so it's amazing, even that short bout of activity can be so effective. And 
you know, one of the things that I think that we've uh, lost in knowledge work is that kind of rhythmicity. And I think our electronic tools play a big role in that. So, you know, instead of um, having a lunch break, um, you know, often we sit at our desk. Now, interestingly, one of the things that I've noticed about Finland is, is that you are really good at taking lunch breaks. It's incredible. So um, I actually live in France now, as I mentioned, but um, I used to live in London. That's where I had my business. I worked in London for a number of years. And um, you know, the lunch break uh, went extinct a long time ago. You know, it's like, and it's a badge of honor, really, not to have a lunch break, uh, or at least it's the norm. If you have a lunch break, it's kind of like you're basically slacking. Um, you know, people are like, you know, you're basically lazy. It's like, you're having a lunch break. We're not working hard enough. Um, but these breaks are, are really precious and they really help us to decompress and if you get some physical activity as well, even if it's just a, a brief walk, then that's so potent uh, for both your mood and your cognition. And one of the things I'd encourage you to do as you know, the light is starting to, to diminish here in uh, this part of the world and, and also the temperature is starting to drop and you know, it's starting to rain more now, is don't give up um, those even very short bouts of activity, even if it's just a little walk. And metabolically as well, physiologically, now, even a 10-minute bout of activity can actually significantly improve what's called your insulin sensitivity. So that's your body's capacity to basically manage um, the, the calories that you're taking in um, and, and make better use of them to stop, in particular, your blood glucose um, staying high, which can cause kind of potentially some issues. So you'll make your body better, you'll make your brain better simply by moving more. So regular exercise, so that's exercise that's a little bit more intense. So go on. Yeah, sure, go for it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> that's good. That's a really good question. So um, for the purpose of the video, the question is, what is my opinion? What does the research suggest about using drugs to aid sleep? So, well, I'd probably start by saying I'm not a medical doctor. Yeah. Don't pretend to be one. Um, but, um, and so I would advise you to speak to a medical professional about these kind of questions. But um, after that kind of caveat, you know, I think that one of the things that seems quite clear about many um, forms of sleep medication is that um, they um, don't promote um, the most restorative type of sleep. Um, so many of them do have a kind of sedative effect, which can um, actually um, disrupt those cycles of, um, uh, of, kind of, of, of non-REM and REM sleep. So you know, in an ideal world, um, we would find ways um, uh, to help people to have natural sleep. But um, I think one of the problems is, is that you know, I think there's, there's likely a place for sleep medication. And again, that's something that people should discuss with their, with their doctors. Um, but, um, but actually, I do think that um, there is a, uh, the rates of sleep medication use that we see and potentially increasing prevalence of the use of sleep medication that some studies would suggest um, is likely because people are addressing the, um, uh, aren't addressing the root causes. Um, they're addressing the symptoms. And so, you know, I think that um, one of the things that we know is that um, too much stress interferes with sleep. And so sometimes people w will resort to using sleep medication, um, which can make sleep even worse, um, because at, rather than dealing with the stress. But also there's these environmental factors um, around sleep, um, which um, they're not addressing. So I'm going to show you in a, in a bit some practical tips to enhance sleep, and you're going to get the chance to rate yourselves on these kind of sleep hygiene behaviors. But in particular, um, people are generally using electronic screens too close to sleep. And we know that um, that blue light actually suppresses melatonin production. And, um, and, and that can interfere with your circadian rhythm and your, your sleep-wake cycles. Because essentially, with that blue light, you're sending a signal to your brain to say, you know, it's daylight outside, you should be alert. And we're going to switch off that melatonin secretion, or at least significantly reduce it. And so actually, often I'd encourage people um, to, before they resorted to medication, to start with these kind of sleep hygiene factors. Um, and, uh, and actually, generally what we find certainly in our clients at Hintza um, is that um, most people can significantly improve their sleep just by improving their sleep hygiene. 
So things like the room temperature, things like making sure the room is dark, avoiding screens, and that medication becomes a kind of last resort. But that said, you know, some of our clients, they travel a lot, they're going through multiple time zones, um, and uh, for periods of time, uh, you know, a number of them have, under medical supervision, uh, supervision used sleep medication. But I think um, ideally it should be a kind of um, a decision that people take with their doctor down the line. Um, and I think there's likely perhaps over prevalence of its use due to us not really addressing what, what is driving it. But yeah, it's a good question. Lots of questions about sleep that always are, amazes me. You know, we all, we've all likely got some room for improvement with our sleep, that's for sure. But exercise. Regular exercise is associated with emotional resilience, and um, uh, to, particularly to acute stress um, in, in healthy adults. So it seems that exercise, so that's a bit more intense exercise, that's where you, know, you can maybe, um, you could still speak in a sentence, but you're just slightly out of breath. You maybe got to speak a sentence and you've got to take a breath. Um, that kind of intensity or above. Um, exercise appears to be a useful preventive strategy to buffer the effects of stress on that autonomic nervous system. So our auto we can see in our autonomic nervous system using kind of measures such as heart rate, heart rate variability, how our physiology is responding, how our bodies are responding to stress. And it seems that actually um, exercise actually helps to buffer some of those effects. We're better able to manage stress um, through when we exercise. But there's also another really interesting um, uh, kind of phenomenon that's emerging in the research. And actually, there was a piece of research released quite recently uh, by a group by Mayer, uh, led by Mayer. And actually, this was published in Harvard Business Review, I think um, maybe last month. And they um, did an observational study, but it actually suggests that learning activities, so when we're engaged in, in learning activities or we, we score more highly on feeling like we are, we are learning, um, you know, on something like, um, uh, you know, uh, there's a number of scales that can, that can explore that, uh, that factor. But learning activities seem to be able to buffer some of the detrimental effects of stress. Now, it's interesting, maybe some of you have observed this or felt it yourselves, anecdotally. If you think about your worst days, when you're most stressed, what does it look like? Are you learning something new? Generally not. Generally, you're kind of buzzing around just trying to fix stuff. But how do you feel after you've had some uninterrupted time to actually learn something new? Or you've had a conversation, or you've spent some time doing something where you've learned. Generally, we feel quite good. We feel quite positive. You know, one of the things that, um, so I mentioned I'm doing my PhD at the moment, and I'm doing it part time. Uh, I've also got a full time job. As I mentioned, I've got a wife and two kids, and I travel a lot. And, um, and so um, the people often say, well, how do you fit in your PhD, James? And why on earth have you decided to do a PhD with all these other commitments? Well, well actually, um, <laughs> this is a bit crazy, but it actually has a kind of buffering effect from stress for me. Because each day, when I allot that bit of time for learning, um, then I feel like I start the day with a sense of accomplishment, whether it's a task that I'm working on or, or something new that I'm discovering. And, and it seems to have this kind of inoculation effect that you know, whatever happens later in the day, then, then actually I feel better able to handle it. And it's one of the things I'd encourage you to do, is you know, particularly in this kind of environment, uh, is to allot some time during the peak period of your day, at least a few times a week, for learning. It might be learning related to your role, it might be learning related to a hobby or other activity. But actually, engaging in learning seems to have a very positive effect uh, in terms of buffering us from stress, as well as all the other benefits that you might get from learning that new thing, whatever that is. But yeah, I said I was going to go back to sleep, because that's such a big driver. And so what we're going to do now is um, I've got these 10 sleep hygiene behaviours. So feel free to take a picture of these. Um, I could also distribute the slides. But what we're going to do now is I'd like you to rate yourselves in relation to each of these 10 sleep hygiene behaviours on a scale of one to three. So where one is you basically never do it, two is you do it sometimes, three is you do it regularly. And then add up those scores, and, um, and actually that should say 30 at the top rather than 27, um, but you should end up with, um, with a score between three, no, sorry, you should end up with, with a score between 10 and 30. Um, I've obviously failed maths today. But, um, but yeah, so uh, you should end up with a score between 10 and 30 um, by rating yourselves from one to three in each of those behaviours. Does, does that make sense? 
And so what I'm going to do then is ask people to, uh, as a show of hands, to embarrass yourself. I'm going to, in three bands, 1 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30. Um, but um, so let's take a couple of minutes. Rate yourselves in those 10 sleep behaviors from 1 to 3 in each. And then add up your score. 1, you never do it. 2, do it sometimes. 3, it's a pretty regular part of your life. And if you've got any questions, just uh, raise your hand and uh, I can help you do that. Okay, I'll give you another minute to do that and then we'll uh, we'll get a bit of feedback. See everyone counting on their fingers. So you're allowed to get your phone out if you need to. Or uh okay. So how many people are in that first band from uh, somewhere? Let's say um, one to nine. Anyone? Ten? How many are in the middle? Kind of somewhere like between ten and twenty. Yeah, anyone in that top band of 21 to 30? Oh, wow. Top of the class. How many people are lying? <laughs> but one of, the, one of the things I'd encourage you to do is, um, is um, remind, keep, remind yourself of this. You know, because if you then find that your sleep starts to, um, uh, to decline in its quality or its quantity, you could check back in with this list. But also, feel free to share that with people that you know, you know people who might benefit from it. Uh, this isn't an exhaustive list, but they're kind of 10 practical tips which um, might be able to help people to significantly improve their sleep quality and also uh, achieve a more adequate quantity of sleep as well. Has everyone had a chance to take a photo of it? Who wants to? And if anyone wants a slide, you can contact me. Um, I can share them on Twitter or whatever. So, but basically, in terms of that study that I mentioned, um, these are some of the relationships which uh, seem to be most promising so far. Things like stress, sleep, resilience, burnout, mood, all having some kind of relation with cognitive performance, particularly sustainable cognitive performance um, uh, through in, in knowledge work. But back to that message again. Even though we often try, even though we sometimes try and convince ourselves, we can't always be on. So, we're going to change gears again, and uh, I'm going to invite my colleague um, Olivia, uh, Olivia, Olivia up, and uh, she's going to introduce um, the uh, Heya Heya app to you. And uh, we're going to do a quick onboarding, which will give you an opportunity to start to think about how you might be able to collectively increase some positive behaviours and promote and encourage some positive behaviours that could improve both your well-being and your performance. So, over to you. Thank you, James. Do you hear me? Yeah. Thank you, James. I'm a mom of two boys, so sleep is always on my mind. Uh, yeah, maybe you can see I'm a bit tired at the moment also. But, so my name is Olivia. I work for the Hints of Performance, same as James. And uh, maybe now you have some really good ideas how you can really improve your wellness and well-being. So I'm here to tell you about the Heya Heya an application that we have that you can put the great ideas that you have today into the practice. So let's go on and take the first step. 
So it's about gamified well-being. So basically everything counts. You get points from being active and making healthy choices. So you do get points from sleeping. I think that's great. And uh, you also get points from cheering your colleagues. You get points from walking over 10,000 steps. And, and the more steps you get, the more levels you go up. So in, in three months, you can just see what's the well-being score you have. And um, maybe you can start a competition between your friends. And there's also a competition in the Alto community that I will tell you later. But uh, it's all about the points. So go on and give it a try. Uh, what's more in there is some, some of our customers use also a journal to log the activities. And I think many of you said that you don't keep track of the sleep you have. So in that case, you can also track and monitor the sleeps, sleep in the program. And we have over 500 different activities. They're covering from gardening, going out with the dog, going, uh, running a marathon or biking, basically anything. And also there are really extensive collection of programs and they're all designed by the HINTS experts, just like James. They range from doing the plank exercise and having the videos to show it how to do it properly to small step in behavioral change, just as you know, no TV time, no Netflix during the evenings, and small reminders, you know, to keep you going on the right path. And also, if you're like me, you want to have things really easy, you can just connect your smartwatch to the Heya Heya, and the, in that way you can get the sleep data you have, the steps you take during the day, and also the exercises you do automatically flown into the Heya Heya app. So in that way you have er everything in the one place. Uh, it's social by nature. It was actually founded, Heya Heya, was founded by two guys from TKK. And they were both running for a marathon and training really hard. And, and the problem was that one of the guys was living in Singapore. And they tried to find out ways how they could cheer each other. And it was really hard by email. So that's why they founded Heya Heya, to cheer each other. Hey, good race, really good uh, run. So, so, and in a way, if you don't feel like going out for a run or doing some healthy exercises, you can just be the good friend and, and cheer your colleagues or students, fellow students. Um, uh, James also talked about how important it is to learn something new. So in Heya Heya we have tips once a week. So you get tips on health hygiene, you get tips uh, covering all the aspects of the well-being, and, uh, and ba it's basically uh, based on your individual interest. So you, if you're not uh, interested in some topics, you won't get tips from those, but really interesting uh, education tips. And so basically, I would like to ask you to start your journey today. It's really simple. You just need to download the application. If you have an account, use the account. If you don't, just create one. And then you need to join the Alta University community. And there's the password. And I think it's been also distributed to you through the intranet channels. And there's a challenge where you can win a book by James. <laughs> and there's also, uh, you can, uh, your team, or then if you're competing as an individual, you can win one month of free training at the Unisport. So go on and log there, and you're collecting the well-being points that I told you earlier. If you have any questions, just come and talk to me, and we'll also, me and my colleague, uh, Alta University student Marco. We are at the Vare building uh, until 3 o'clock and we have a competition there also. So come and talk to us. But I think now it's time to let James continue with this one. Thanks, Olivia. That was, just grab that. So, yeah, so these digital tools, powerful assistants, terrible masters. But hopefully, this is a way that you can use them in a really positive way. 
to start to put some of these ideas into action. Um, but going back to that rhythms again, I think one of the reasons these tools can sometimes be helpful is that they can make us more aware of those rhythms that we have, how much we're actually sleeping or not, how hard we're working, are we working too hard. Um, but one of the things that I'm convinced of is that in a similar way that we have a framework to plan for physical endurance, we need a framework to plan for cognitive endurance. And so using my kind of sports science head and the frameworks that I'm very familiar with, I took some inspiration from that plan for physical endurance um, that uh, we used with that cyclist, Claire, at the beginning of this presentation and adapted it to create a plan for cognitive endurance. And that plan I call cognitive gears. But before we get into that, I've got another little challenge for you. We're going to test our brains. Okay? So the first thing I'd like you to do is to remember five words. Okay? Ready? Bottle, chair, bag, phone, camera. Got it? The next thing I'd like you to do is to recite the final five letters of the alphabet backwards, out loud. I know that's a bit of a stretch to actually, you know, be heard, but go for it. Final, the English alphabet, please. <laughs> Good question. You ready? I can't hear anybody. Last five letters out loud. Backwards. <laughs> anyway, well, hopefully you experience some cognitive load as a result of that. Um, it's, uh, and then finally, I'd like you to calculate 15 times 19 in your head. And when you've got the answer, raise your hand, but don't shout it out. Not that that would be a problem. 15 times 19, calculate it in your head, and then raise your hand when you've got the answer. One five, 15 times 19, okay. So, anyone got the answer? Oh, no one wants to, no one wants, everyone's worried about being wrong. Well, it's, it's 285, just in case you're worried. Um, but how many people can remember those first five words? How many people can remember all five? Yeah, how many people can remember four? Yeah, four is the average. I won't ask anyone less than four. It's just a bit embarrassing. But basically, um, that's about the average number of items we can hold in our working memory. There's kind of more, there's less. But that little game actually had a, a deeper point. And, and what it was designed to do was to help you to experience three different types of cognitive activity which accumulate to form, to represent the cognitive load that we might experience during a given time. So you experience those three different types of cognitive activity then, which accumulate and add up to cognitive load. And the first thing that you experienced was some time pressure. And I put you under a bit of pressure there. I was going through the questions. And you know, if I'd asked you, for example, 15 times 19 with no pressure, I'm sure that you would have got there easily. But just because I introduced time pressure actually increased the cognitive load that was associated with that activity. The second component was complexity. You know, if I'd asked you what is 2 plus 2, versus 15 times 19, I imagine that 2 plus 2 would have come into your head a lot more quickly. So complexity increases cognitive load. But then finally, perhaps most significantly, I introduced switching. Because if I get you to interweave tasks rather than do them in sequence, then I'll significantly increase cognitive load. You know, I was getting you to move between trying to remember words and load up your working memory, trying to think about letters in a slightly unusual way, then do some mental arithmetic, and then go back and start to try and remember the words I, that I'd said at the beginning. So these three components accumulate to create a cognitive load. And I'd like you to think for a moment about your average day. How is your, your average day characterized in the context of these three different types of cognitive activity? How complex are the tasks that you're engaged with? How much time pressure do you feel like you're under? How often do you have to switch? So you can imagine that cognitive load increases on the continuum, and then we can, we can split it up into three what I call cognitive gears. You've got a low cognitive gear, which is characterized by rest, recovery, and reflection where we may be not switching a lot, but the work that we're doing is certainly not complex, and we don't have a lot of time pressure. 
there is a high cognitive gear where we're focused, where we're engaged in that analytic and that really productive work, where we're very focused, where there's a high cognitive load, where the work is likely very complex. And then there's a middle cognitive gear where we're engaged in those menial tasks of moderate complexity and the switching work that likely characterizes most or at least part of our knowledge work day. But if you think for a moment about those three cognitive gears, how is your day characterized in the context of those gears? Where do you spend the majority of your time? You, many of us find that we spend the majority of our day stuck in that cognitive middle gear. A cognitive middle gear that's characterized by being caught, by being caught in pseudo work and switching. You know, I do a little experiment wherever I go. I buy a takeout coffee, I stand in the queue, I look around and I see what happens. And there is a global epidemic. No one anywhere in the world seems capable of standing in a queue for longer than a few seconds without, what do we do? Pull out a phone. So what could have been an opportunity to rest in that low gear, to look around, to allow ourselves to recover, often becomes this form of pseudo work, whether it's checking our email or social media. You know, actually that involves switching, even though we're familiar with the interface, there's actually a relatively high degree of complexity, and so we just don't recover. So we're caught in that pseudo work and we're caught in switching. We feel stressed, we feel like we're on someone else's schedule, and actually there's this concept called attention residue. Whenever we switch tasks, some of our attention remains stuck to one task, we have to kind of peel it off and stick it to another. And that's effortful. And it means that when we try to switch gears into that high gear to focus and be productive, or down into that low gear to rest, then it makes it harder than it should. Digital tools, powerful assistants, terrible masters. Do you know that multitasking can cannibalize up to 40% of your productive time? Cognitive capacity is significantly reduced even if our smartphone is within reach, even if it's just switched off. Intensive smartphone users often feel a separation anxiety when their smartphone's not with them. Oh, that's none of us here, is it? I'm sure. Amusement isn't rest. We often conflate the two. We confuse them. But we get caught in these cycles, you know, refresh, scroll, repeat, in search of that surprise, that dopamine hit, that something new. Now, at this limitless life, being always on, paradoxically, that limitlessness may be a limiter. So, but why do we struggle to do the right thing? Because we all know, don't we? We all know what we need to do. As we start to come into land today in the kind of final part of this presentation, I'm gonna talk about some of the reasons why we struggle and maybe try and introduce some solutions. But generally, the evidence is quite clear that when we rely on self-control, we generally fail. Now, we can build self-control. One of the ways we can build self-control is by trying hard, for example. And we can develop new habits. I'm sure that hopefully we've experienced that and maybe a tool like Hey Hey can help you to do it. But 25% of people abandon their New Year's resolutions after one week. How many people here have actually uh, ever managed to stick to a New Year's resolution? One, that's good. 60% of people, <laughs> 60% of people abandon their New Year's resolutions within one month. And most people the average person makes the same New Year's resolution 10 times without success. We're just not very good at making new habits. And there's this great quote by a guy called Dave Sivers who founded a company called CD Baby. Uh, he's worth looking at actually, he's an interesting guy. And he says that if information was enough, we'd all be billionaires with perfect abs. And it's true, isn't it? There is enough information out there on YouTube that I could get a six pack and be a billionaire. You know, I could get rich quick or whatever. But information isn't enough. And it can feel like a battle. It can feel like there's this tension between what we know we need to do, get more sleep, reduce caffeine, and what we actually do, what we end up doing most of the time. And I think one of the reasons is, is that we're not really addressing the root cause of our self-control and our behavior change problem. Now, the literature would suggest, I'm inclined to agree, that our human capacity for self-control is probably one of the most powerful and beneficial adaptations of our psyche. 
you know, relative to animals, we're able to pause, to reflect, to actually direct our attention and our energy towards higher level goals. You know, my, uh, my wife and I um, spent a bit of time in the Lake District where she's got some relatives and one of them has got this giant golden retriever. And we take it for walks in the forest near to where our aunt lives. And you know, this dog, as we take it for walks, whenever it saw a squirrel, it was gone. It was like a nightmare for this thing to see a squirrel because it would run off into the forest. We'd have to try and find it. You know, it had zero self-control. <laughs> but as humans, we've got these higher level cognitive functions. We can actually resist distraction and interruption. We don't need to chase every squirrel that we see. But, but actually, I think that these digital tools sometimes are eroding that capacity for self-control. And actually, maybe we're not chasing squirrels, but we are continuously finding ourselves on email or Twitter or whatever, checking in like on our communication tools once every six minutes. But it's not because we're bad people. It's not because there's something wrong with us. You know, the evidence is quite clear that whenever we rely on willpower, we generally fail. And the reason for that is that you know, for most of human history, willpower has been sufficient. But also, willpower and self-control actually seems to operate more like a valuation process rather than this battle between what we want to do and, and what we think we should do. It actually seems that there's a part of the brain called the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex that when we're engaged in self-control decisions seems to make kind of cost-benefit evaluations and that self-control actually seems to operate more like a valuation system than a battle. So one of the kind of techniques that we might be able to use to improve our self-control and actually make it more likely that we'll do the things that we want to do or that we know we should do is actually to try and manipulate that valuation system and remind ourselves what we really value and try and link those goals, whatever they are, whether it's sleeping better or eating better or exercising more with the thing that we really care about. Because so often we say, oh, I should sleep more or sleep more adequately. But it's not really about sleep, is it? You know, it's actually about how we feel as a result of it and how we feel for the goal that, we really, that really matters to us. It might be about ha having more energy for your work or for your family. It might be about some kind of long-term goal that you've got, something that you're working towards. It might be about trying to manage your stress uh, just so you feel better and you feel that life is more sustainable. So one of the things I'd really encourage you to do today when you're taking all these ideas and all this theory away and all these, these hopefully, some actions that you can start to integrate with your life, is that think about those actions, but make sure you link them with something that you really care about, something that really sits at your core, that really is important. So you activate that part of your brain, that dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, so that you actually attribute a higher value to it when you're making that cost-benefit decision. See, the problem that we have is that you know, our valuation system was built for a different age. For most of human history, that valuation system was linked to a very different world. And you know, we can see that in some of the cognitive biases that we have. One of the biases which many of you will be aware of is the novelty bias. You know, for most of human history, that novelty bias was incredibly adaptive. So for a moment, I'd like you to imagine I'm a prehistoric person in a prehistoric world. And I'm walking through my prehistoric village and each day I look across and I see a mountain. I see this mountain range. And each day I start to wonder what is on the other side of that mountain? And I've never been there before, but my brain knows that there's something new. And actually in anticipation of finding something new on the other side of that, of that mountain, my brain actually secretes dopamine. So merely anticipating the novelty on the other side of the mountain actually gives me a sense of reward. And that sense of reward and that drive for novelty actually encourages me to take the risks and invest the effort and the time to go and explore on the other side of that mountain. And so for most of human history, that's been incredibly adaptive because that drive for novelty has meant that we've explored, we've populated most of the planet, we've been able to find new resources and new places. But today, that incredibly powerful drive for novelty is linked to a continuous stream of information right in our pocket. And that's why self-control isn't really sufficient, because we're not going to be able to get rid of that hard wiring for novelty. We've got to manipulate our environment instead. And that practically often means turning the phone off at certain periods, airplane mode, putting it away in a different room, even if you experience that separation anxiety. So we've got this novelty bias, but we've also got a negativity bias. Why is that? Well. Imagine again, I'm a prehistoric person in my prehistoric society, and um, I'm being initiated into the tribe 
and so I've got to go out on a hunt. But unlike my prehistoric peers, I've recently been to a positive psychology seminar by one of the leading prehistoric world positive psychologists. And, and uh, the seminar leader has told me, James, you need to get over your negativity bias. You know, actually, you need to believe in a safer world. Just turn that frown upside down. Think about something a bit more positive. So I go out on the hunt with my prehistoric peers as I'm walking along through the undergrowth, everyone's scared, everyone's worried, but I march ahead with my positive mindset. You know, the world is actually a lot safer than you think, guys, so don't worry. And over behind, you know, a rock, I see something fluffy, I wonder what it is, and I go and take a look, and oh my, what, what big teeth you have. The positive prehistoric person would not have lasted for very long. That negativity bias served us very well. But today, in the modern world, that negativity bias is actually being manipulated and used to distract and interrupt and take away our time and our energy. You know, if you actually look at the, kind of the, the negativity of news cycles, there's some interesting data, Stephen Pinker republished it in a book that he wrote last year, to show how since the 1950s, uh, the negative tone of news headlines has significantly decreased. Probably dis, uh, has, has increased, sorry, the news, uh, news uh, headlines have got significantly more negative. Even though, you know, has the world got any worse or do we just know more about how bad it is? And so I don't think we can necessarily eliminate that negativity bias, but I think we can learn to manage it. And we can learn to be aware of when we might be drawn into that negativity. And actually, I think that positive psychology has got some very useful tools that can help us to manage some of that negativity bias and hopefully to manage our attention more effectively uh, and actually hopefully to improve our well-being and maybe even our performance too. But I think that you know, when we sometimes feel drawn into that negativity and drawn into that novelty, we've got this inclination to beat ourselves up, to kind of say, oh, if only I had more willpower, if only I had more self-control. But actually, it's quite natural. We're just human, and we need to find ways to manage these things better. Again, for most of human history, there was this good balance. There was a good balance between the control that we had available and the choices that we had. You know, why do we find eating behavior so difficult to manage? Well, for you know, most of human history, there wasn't enough food. And if there was enough food, well, a famine would be coming relatively quickly. And why did we need activity trackers? You know, I had this weird moment when I was writing uh, that book that uh, Olivia mentioned earlier. And um, I was sitting there writing a chapter about um, activity and exercise. And my uh, activity tracker buzzed to remind me. And it said on the screen, um, you need to move. It's time to move. <laughs> I thought, what kind of world do we live in when I need a little watch to tell me to move? It's weird, isn't it? You know, for most of human history, we were either running towards or away from something. And so we shouldn't feel so bad because we're really trying to understand how to survive and thrive in this new world. And we're really at the beginning of that process. And hopefully, I've started to share a few ideas to help you to do that. But I think that you know, one of the things that we need to do is to rethink control. And maybe one of the things that we need to um, rethink is also our current ways of living and working and rediscover some of that seasonality in our work and our life, to rediscover some of those rhythms. It seems that, according to the literature, if we want to change our behavior, being proactive is the key. So we see that the people who are best at self-control seem to structure their lives to avoid making self-controlled decisions in the first place. It's an interesting phenomenon, isn't it? So actually, the people with the highest measurable self-control actually seem to use it the least day to day. They do things in advance. So I've taken this idea and I've tried to apply it to my own life. And one of the ways that I do that um, is around exercise in particular. And so um, I travel a lot, as I mentioned, and keeping a regular exercise routine is difficult. So the first thing that I've done is to lower the bar for what exercise is. It's not training anymore, it's just movement. And then very practically, I always pack my gym kit in its own little bag and I put it at the top of my bag so that there's no excuse. And then the final thing that I do is that I make a commitment with myself. And that if I arrive to a hotel and the gym is open, I make a commitment that I'll put my gym kit on and I'll walk to the gym. I don't even make a commitment to myself that I will do a workout, simply that I'll walk to the gym. And, and so that seems to calm the little kind of the primal part of my brain because I'm not making my aspiration kind of seem too difficult. And generally, nine times out of 10, I do that and I'll do something in the gym when I'm there. But that self-control decision was actually made way before. If I left it to when I arrived at the hotel, it wouldn't happen. 
but by making the self-control decision in advance, by manipulating my environment, by packing the gym kit and setting up that habit, it's much more likely that that idea gets put into action. But what can we do? How can we take all this theory and apply it to our lives? Well, I think that one of the most important principles is that we don't make perfect the enemy of good enough. Yeah, that's so important, isn't it? Set the bar a bit lower than maybe you think you need to. Just start somewhere. And remember that progress isn't linear. You know, life means that we take two steps forward and often we take one step back. It's just how it is. In terms of rediscovering that seasonality, I want to leave you with a practical framework that many of our clients and I myself have found useful. Think about structuring your years in the context of three different seasons. Seasons for modern knowledge work. Seasons that I call recharge, normal, and mission. It's likely that you'll go through these seasons multiple times during the year. You might not necessarily even go through them in sequence, but these three seasons have distinct characteristics. Recharge time, that's the time to try and do the right things, to get adequate sleep, to stop caffeine and alcohol early, to not use those screens late into the night, to get some exercise. You know, often what we find is that we get to the weekend and for some reason we use that as the excuse to kind of go off the rails. But actually those weekends are probably the best time when you've got a bit more time to do the right things. Then in normal time, you know, the working week, don't try and change the world. Maybe just pick one behavior that you can tweak. Just try and change one thing slightly and, and work on that. And then in the mission time, when you're away on a trip, when you're trying to finish a challenging project, when everything goes out the window, well, you can't control that. But hopefully you'll have more in the tank, you'll have more energy available to draw from when you experience that inevitable mission. Today, I'd like you to commit to start with one small positive change. I've given you all kinds of ideas, but is there one idea in particular that stood out? And before you leave today, I'd encourage you to think of that idea and share it with one person. Because the other thing about humans is that we really don't like to let people down. When we tell someone we're gonna do something, you know, we, we hate to let them down. So what I'd like you to do is, before you leave today, pick one idea that you're going to try and put into action. It could be something very simple that you're going to tweak. Share that with somebody and ask them to keep you accountable. You know, that could be through hey hair, could be something you track and they cheer there, or it could be something that they simply ask you the question when they see you in a couple of weeks, have you done that thing? That experiment could be at an individual level. Actually, there's some evidence to suggest that at a corporate level, it can be more powerful. And that's one of the reasons why we set up those campaigns. But as we approach the finish line today, I'm gonna to give you some really practical ideas that you might choose to put into action. The first ideas are for that high cognitive gear. Where can you focus your effort? Well, begin by paying attention to when you are at your best and schedule some high gear time for the peak in your day. During that high gear focused productive time, experiment with working 25 minutes on and five minutes off, rather than checking your communication tools once every six minutes. And finally, during that peak period, try to actively proactively engineer an environment for focus. That might mean turning off the phone, it might mean using noise cancelling headphones, it might mean going somewhere where you're not going to be interrupted or distracted once every 11 minutes, like most knowledge workers. If you're a leader of a team here, you can play a crucial role in helping your teams to engineer an environment for focus, to actually encourage this kind of peak work, which especially in this kind of academic context is a key differentiator and competitive advantage. For that low cognitive gear, well, how can you find time to take the rest? Well, begin by actually scheduling rest each day. Now, I think in this Finnish culture, as I mentioned, you're already great at taking lunch breaks, but I'd encourage you to get proactive about taking and even scheduling regular breaks through the working day, and also being proactive about how you recover during the weekend too. Evidence would suggest that the most effective breaks are active, social, and natural. So maybe take a walk with someone that you like, look at the trees, it's a great opportunity to recharge. Finally, as I've mentioned so many times and as many people have asked questions about, 
we need to find ways to sleep seven to nine hours per night because sleep is one of the most potent cognitive enhancers that we have available. For that middle cognitive gear, how can we find and follow our own rhythm? We'll begin by setting some boundaries for those switching tasks so that that switching work and that me those menial tasks don't leak into every conscious moment. When you have to do those inevitable uh, switching tasks, it can make sense to try and synchronize those switching tasks and that menial work with the rebound in your day. You know, whether that's you're an early bird, your rebound will probably come in the afternoon. If you're an owl, that rebound might start in the morning. But don't mix the peak and the rebound menial work. And finally, don't be among the 79% of people who start their day by checking their smartphone. Because starting the day with email is starting on someone else's schedule. Some of the emerging evidence that I got from that study, it's totally uh, pre-published, um, but I think I can probably show a bit of it in this context, is that people who sleep adequately and have manageable stress seem to exhibit 10 to 15% better cognitive performance in terms of inhibitory control in particular. Other evidence suggests that improving employee well-being can increase productivity by 19%. The mood boost of improved sleep, according to some research, is equivalent to a £200,000 lottery win. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? And the effect on the individual of all of these factors could be real focus, reduced stress, enhanced recovery. Well-being, as well as being important to us as individuals, is set to become a business value of strategic importance. So what is the key to sustainable high performance? Well, I actually think there are three. The first is this. Be clear about where to focus effort. The second, be disciplined about when to rest. And finally, perhaps most importantly, Find and follow your own rhythm. Pay attention to when you are at your best. Knowledge work, it's an endurance activity. Thank you.